All right, thanks for watching. And because you can't come to appreciate the light until you've seen the darkness, today I will do an example of a function that's not uniformly continuous. And more precisely, I will show that the function 1 over x, so show that f of x equals 1 over x, is not uniformly continuous on 0 comma 1. And before I do this, be very careful. It turns out this function is uniformly continuous on the interval 2 comma infinity. So the point is the interval 0 comma 1 will matter somehow. And before I prove this, let me tell you at least intuitively why it shouldn't be uniformly continuous. Remember, uniform continuity means the delta doesn't depend on where you're at. You can choose the same delta no matter which position you are in. However, this is not true for this function because suppose we want to make the function this small. So kind of epsilon to be very small. Then notice, if you're closer to 1, then delta can actually be very big. So you can choose delta that big, such that if x and y is less than delta, then we have f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. However, if you're closer to 0, then to make f of x minus f of y less than epsilon, well, delta actually has to be extremely small. You see, so you cannot just choose the same delta here to work for here. And that's why the function is not uniformly continuous. However, we have to prove this. And in order to show this, let me remind you of the definition of uniform continuity. So definition. Okay. F is uniformly continuous if for all epsilon there is is delta such that for all x and y in 0 comma 1 x minus y is less than delta implies f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon so this is uniformly continuous. And well, to get not uniformly continuous, we just need to negate that statement. Meaning you replace for all by there exists, and there exists by for all. So again, this was uniform continuity, and therefore not uniform continuity, just means there is epsilon positive, such that for all delta, there is, or there are, x and y in 0, 1, such that even though x minus y is less than delta, we have the opposite here. So f of x minus f of y is greater or equal to epsilon. So again, this is important. Not uniform continuity means there is some epsilon such that no matter how small delta is, we can find counterexamples x and y that are delta close, but such that f of x minus f of y is greater or equal to epsilon. And in terms of proof strategy, what do we need to do? First of all, we need to find epsilon, which you'll see there's a little miracle that'll happen. So, let, let's say epsilon be 1, for instance. And then um, here, we just fix delta. So we let delta be arbitrary. And then we need to find x and y such that this statement is true. And we'll do a lot of weird stuff to find x and y. Just know once we found them, then we're done. We just need to find two specific counterexamples. All right, so let's do this now. So step one, just scratch work. 
So everything except the last step is scratch work. So uh, there is epsilon. Well, we'll find it later or not. We'll see. So let epsilon be to be announced. And let's fix delta. And the point is, all our goal is just to find those x and y. And for this, as is usual, let's focus on this inequality. So let's do f of x minus f of y. Well, by definition, this is just 1 over x minus 1 over y. And the nice thing is you can put it on a common denominator so it's y minus x over absolute value of xy. However, remember that x and y are non-negative because they are in the interval 0, 1. So we can remove the absolute value. And we get y minus x over xy. And remember, our goal is to have this greater or equal to epsilon. So we need a greater or equal sign. Now, here's the thing. Well, turns out, of course, the result is false if x equals y, because then you will get 0, which is not greater or equal to epsilon. And um, therefore, we can assume, no problem at all, uh, that x is not equal to y. And without loss of generality, just assume y is less than x. And what's great about this is then we have 1 over y is greater than 1 over x, which is why this thing becomes greater than something. We'll see. So y minus x over xy. Well, notice this is really y minus x over x times 1 over y. So this actually becomes greater than or equal to y minus x over x times x. So dos x, and we get y minus x over x quadrado, and you want this to be greater or equal to epsilon. All right. Very good. So we already simplified this a bit. Now, for the next step, let's focus on this quantity. Well, it's such as some positive quantity, so let's just call it A. So let A be this distance. So let A be uh, y minus x. And a couple of things. So because y, x is not y, this is actually positive. And moreover, remember we want this distance to be less than delta, so actually A is less than delta. And this is useful in our search for A. So we want to do this. And why is this useful to find A? Because notice, if we knew A and we knew x, we can actually find y. So in other words, y is already determined here. Because note, what do we have? y minus x equals a. Well, that just implies y minus x equals plus or minus a. So either y minus x is minus a, or y minus x is a. And this means y is either x minus a, or y is x plus a. That said, notice this is bigger than x, but we had that y must be less than x. So actually, we can exclude this possibility. And therefore, we get that y is x minus a. In other words, again, if you knew what x is and what a are, which we'll do, we can figure out what y is. All right, very good. And now, well, our next step is uh, to figure out what x is. So step three. So step three, find x. 
Now, for this, let's go back to our identity. Well, we had, uh, I think, y minus x over x squared. But now, again, this is a constant, a over x squared. And we just want to set this greater or equal to epsilon. And what this implies, we get that x squared is less than or equal. So you just swap those things, a over epsilon. And since x is positive, we get x is less than or equal to square root of a over epsilon. And now remember, we just need to find one counterexample. So uh, if you just let x to be that, let's see what happens. So let, I know lots of lets today. Who let the dog out? Right? OK, anyway, and then we get let uh, x be square root of a over epsilon. And well, then we know what y is. So and then y is x minus a, which is square root of a over epsilon minus a. This is all in good, but remember, we have two things. We haven't found a yet. And also, it's not clear, and in fact, not always true, that x and y are in your intervals. So next step. So show that x and y are in your interval 0, 1. All right, here is the thing. Well, x is square root of a over epsilon, which is positive. Therefore, OK, we know that x is positive. No problem. So the interesting case happens when x is less than 1. But look, x less than 1, that's equivalent to square root of a over epsilon, is less than 1. And that's equivalent to a over epsilon, is less than 1 squared, which is 1. Which is equivalent to a, is less than epsilon. Which actually gives us another requirement. Remember, we had a positive, less than delta. But now we need a to be less than epsilon. All right, now what about y? Well, notice y is square root of a over epsilon minus a. Well, this is positive, so it's less than square root of a over epsilon. But now we, we had that this thing is less than 1. So in fact, y is less than 1. So that's not a problem. And the main thing is to figure out when y is bigger than 1, bigger than 0. So now y is bigger than 0 if and only if square root of a over epsilon minus a is bigger than 0. And that's equivalent to a is less than square root of a over epsilon. And since everything is positive, it's equivalent to squaring this. a squared is less than a over epsilon. But now you can cancel out a. And you get, actually, a is less than 1 over epsilon. So in fact, another requirement that we have is that a is less than 1 over epsilon. And the good news is, now we're ready for our proof. And here's the miracle, by the way. Does the value of epsilon matter? Well, not at all. So we don't even need to find it. It's true, actually, for all epsilon in this example. But in general, be careful. You need to find epsilon. All right, and now we're ready for our proof. So step five, let's now attack. So let epsilon be whatever you want. Because again, it turns out this is true for every epsilon. So if you want, you can just let epsilon be 1, and then you do your proof. But doesn't matter. And let delta be given. And now, before we do x, let's just do a, first of all. So choose a positive such that. So a is less than, remember three things. It's less than delta, less than epsilon, and less than 1 over epsilon. So choose a be such that a is less than the minimum 
of all those things. And with that, let x be square root of a over epsilon and y be square root of a over epsilon minus a. Right? Then we've shown that x and y are in our interval. And if you take the difference, x minus y, that is square root of a over epsilon minus square root of a over epsilon minus a, well, this cancels out, and we just get a, which by definition is less than delta. So x minus y is less than delta. And finally, well, f of x minus f of y. We calculated that to be y minus x over xy. And we saw this is greater or equal to y minus x over x quadrado. And y minus x is exactly a. And then x squared, here's x, is just a over epsilon. So in fact, this becomes a times epsilon over a, which cancels out and gives you epsilon. And then we're done. Why? Because we found epsilon. Let's say epsilon is 1, such that for all delta, there are x and y, such that x minus y is less than delta, but f of x minus f of y is greater or equal to epsilon. All right, and that's it. Thank you very much.